Hey, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. And if you are just finding our show, welcome to you. And be sure to stay tuned because at the end of each episode, Margaret Stewart will be sharing her book recommendations. And it is because of her expertise that today's guest is joining us. So thank you, Margaret. Insert eye roll because... She's in the know, and I was in the don't know category, needed to wake up. Our guest today writes scary, suspenseful page turners destined to make readers lose sleep. He's mean that way, but in a creative way, right? (laughs) His new book has survived the night, and his 2020 bestseller, Home Before Dark, is now available in paperback. And let me read from his own Instagram for the perfect introduction. Riley Sager is a writer, a reader, movie lover, New York Times best-selling author of books that make my parents question the way they raised me. And with that, Riley, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm um, thinking about parenting, and I think that is probably one of the funniest lines ever. Um, you survive the night is crazy. I could not put it down. And I made the reference to Margaret's recommendations because I was... I didn't know. And when you don't know, you just don't know. You hear about an author and you you feel left out. And then you're like, well, maybe it's too late for me to hop on this train. I mean, it's five books out. What am I going to do? And um, it was, you know, with a a shocking revelation to see what I had been missing. And then now I'm in, you know, a a stressful space of how do I go back and dig through this catalog? Where am I going to find the time and which one will I choose first? Well, the good thing is that they're all standalones, and so you don't need to read one to understand the other, and so you can just pick up whichever one you want and hopefully enjoy it. Yes. Well, okay. And we also have the the paperback of uh, Home Before Dark, so that is maybe maybe that's a sign for me. Um, let's talk about Survive the Night. It was fantastic. We are in the 1990s, so thank you very much for taking me back to my most happy space. Set the scene for me with Charlie and why she's going to be taking a ride with a stranger. Yes. So it is November 1991, and Charlie is a college student who has gone through quite a lot. And um, her roommate was murdered by a man known as the campus killer. And Charlie is feeling all this grief and guilt and pain. And she just needs to leave school right now. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that college students did in 1991, because I was a college student (laughs) in the 90s, was they had a ride board on campus. And so you went to the ride board. And if you needed to go someplace, find where someone else might be heading and people put up flyers saying, I'm headed to Ohio. Anyone else going that way? Let's split a ride. So Charlie does that and she meets a man named Josh. And he's like, I'm going to Ohio too. Let's share the drive. And basically no sooner do they get on the highway that Charlie starts to think that maybe Josh isn't all he says he is and that he may in fact be the campus killer who murdered his roommate. So she's bringing to the table a lot, right? She's gone through the trauma of losing her roommate in a a horrific way, as you mentioned. She is also a film major, and so she's got this sort of encyclopedic a knowledge of films, in particular film noir and suspenseful stories. And so she is sort of looking for the thriller plot and has inserted herself in one. Um, but there's even more to it than that with her because she sort of, um, for moments, hallucinates that that her life is a film. So there's a real blur for her between fiction and reality. Yeah, um, Charlie has this self-defense mechanism where if things get too stressful for her, her, she just starts to envision things as a movie. She calls them the movies in her mind. And it's a distancing mechanism where she's, if it's a movie, then it can't hurt her. And um, sometimes that could be beneficial. Other times when you're in a car on a highway at night with a man you think might be a serial killer, it might not be so helpful. And so there is a bit of, her questioning, okay, is this really happening? Is this a movie in my mind? And it's there's a lot of head games going on in the book, and it was a lot of fun to write them. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're messing with our minds throughout start to finish. It, and it is, it is such a clever 
a storytelling device and I was almost thinking, gosh, I'm really surprised that that this hasn't been done before or, or at least not that I've come across because it did. It it allows for, uh, we always laugh about, say, horror movies where, you know, like, what am I going to do? Let me run out into the forest alone. Um, it, but it, it, it makes a rational explanation for why Charlie might make choices that don't necessarily make sense for those of us who want to live. <laughs> yes, exactly. Charlie does make a lot of very questionable choices in the book, but there's also many different reasons for them. And the main one being the movies in her mind and her inability to, to trust reality. And then there's there's other things going on that can be, you know, are revealed later in the book. But it's all it's all a very deep psychological stew that she's experiencing. <laughs> well, and then she's also a college girl. So I think if we were to be honest and reflect back, we all make a lot of choices that don't necessarily make sense when uh, you're looking back, if you're watching the, the movie of your life. Uh, the, the close quarters of a vehicle made for me this so stressful and enjoyable because I get very uncomfortable when people are, are, are sharing a real close space. And so the idea of being in a car with a stranger for such a long period of time had me all like prickly right from the jump. So was there anything about maybe quarantining pandemic when you're working on this story that made you kind of hone into that tight space and the tension that comes from that feeling of lockup? Well, it's ironic because I came up with the idea before any of us had ever heard of COVID. And it started as a challenge as a writer. It was like, okay, what can I do to be as suspenseful as possible, but also as simple as possible? Two people in a car and lots of suspicion. And then when it came time to write it, by then we'd all heard of COVID and I was stuck at home like everyone else. And that sense of claustrophobia and isolation really did inform the writing of the book. I was feeling mighty claustrophobic and itching to just get out when I was writing the book. And, and coming from that space as a reader too, I think it, it intensifies everything that you've put together in this and, and it's just fantastic. So the music and the time period, of course, are, are very important. Also many film references because Charlie is bringing that to the table. Um, I love that you put together not only a Spotify playlist to accompany this book, but also you've got a movie list. So all of these reference points and, and kind of you know the scary things that um, will help us appreciate this even more and kind of feed our desire to be um, staying up with all the lights on at night. So <laughs> how did you put all of this together? And I think it, it, it really creates that experience. I love the, this, the time period of being set in the 90s. This, this was my first tape, by the way, that I put in my first car. So it's perfect mine for me. too. <laughs> yeah. It, well, I said it in 1991 for two reasons. One, I knew just the plot of the story couldn't take place today because we all have cell phones. And for a writer, cell phones are just the death of suspense because it's so easy to get out of many <laughs> situations. And so I wanted it to be in a time where you were at the mercy of pay phones and there was no GPS and no Uber. And then also 1991 is when I was a senior in high school. And I remember that time vividly, like most of us do about our senior mm -hmm. year of high school. And I knew I wouldn't have to do that much research. <laughs> no historical research for me. And I remember it all. And so the, the music at the time, like the Nirvana and the Cure and Susie and the Banshees, like that's all what I listened to back then. And the, the movie references... I just, it was fun to, when writing Charlie, I knew that she would be thinking of movies that she had seen and how those characters had behaved and how maybe she would, should behave like some of these characters because they survived their movies. And, and so I, by the time I finished the book, there were just dozens and dozens of movies referenced. And I thought, I need to make a list of this. <laughs> And, and so I thought it would be helpful to the reader who might not be familiar with all of them to just put it up on my website. And so they could see like, okay, every one of these movies is mentioned in the book. Now maybe I'm going to 
watch some of them. That is so cool. It, it's it's just a, it's a great idea because I think, and especially now in the days of social media, I mean, if, if a reader is loving your work, we want to kind of immerse ourselves in in the headspace that you, that is allowing these words to come to the page and entertain us. And so it's it's a very it's it's experiential, and and I think it's it's really genius. And I was just laughing because there was just. The other day, I was listening to the Spotify um, Depeche Mode radio station. <laughs> so I was like, "Wait a second! I've been yes. listening to all of these, all of these old favorites uh, quite frequently." Anyway, and then we speckle in a, a little bit of uh, references to um, to some of the old films as well. So it's it's very creative and very cool. I want to talk to you about just what was it five years ago or so that this life started to become reality for you. Um, what what happened that launched your book under Riley Sager that that changed everything? Um, oh gosh, so much. Well, one, I wrote a book called Final Girls, and it was it's it's pretty common knowledge that Riley Sager isn't my real name. <laughs> it's it's a pen name because I'd been published before under my real name, and I just had zero success. And so. I had been laid off from my job. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And I was desperate. So I wrote this book called Final Girls. And my agent read it and said, this could be big. Um, let's release it under a pen name, <laughs> see what happens. And what happened is that six months before it came out, um, a little author some of you might have heard of named Stephen King got a hit, got a copy, read it, and then tweeted about it. What? Saying how he loved it. And so then a week later, based on that tweet, my book was an entertainment weekly. <laughs> and then like the week the book came out, it was like Whoopi Goldberg was talking about it on the view. And I, it just was like this whole surreal thing that I still can't quite wrap my head around. Wow. And so, yeah, ever since then, it's it's I've been writing and releasing a book a year. And um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been doing really well. Wow. OK, so many follow up questions. Number one, did you ever send any kind of thank you care package to whomever in HR or was your supervisor that told you to, to hit the road? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> At least a I'm book st- box. Come on. I'm, I'm, st- I'm still a little <laughs> bitter about that, to be honest. But so, it, it, yeah, it's and my life has just changed completely from where I was five years ago. And it's 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 so it's so bizarre in but, many, many ways. Well, I was just talking about this with a friend in the studio as we were finishing up. And, um, you, you know, that how some people are able to capitalize and find their true greatness when they're hit with adversity. And others of us would just drink heavily and cry in the corner and pout. And so I'd really have nothing great emerge from, from you know, this, 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 you know, fork in the road. So the fact that you were able to channel all of that creativity at that moment um, is just, I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. It's like, you would go, well, who, who was that before? Yeah, it's 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 a, almost a fairy tale thing that that kind of happened to me, and um, yeah, it's it's amazing. So Stephen King, I imagine that you were quite a fan, given the nature of your work. How surreal was that to even think of the idea that Stephen King was holding the story and reading a story that you wrote? I mean, what? was there, I mean, are you guys like now lunch buddies or how does that, how does that go? <laughs> well, I, I didn't, I didn't even know that he was reading it. I, it wasn't because again, it was six months before the book even came out. And so the last thing I was thinking was like, Oh, Stephen King is reading this right now and loving it. <laughs> so it was, it was such a surprise when I got an email from a friend of mine who is also an author, Jennifer Hillier. She writes amazing books. And she just sent me an email saying, just saw Stephen King's tweet. Congrats. Huh? And I went, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> and then when it finally like sank in, it just was the swell of emotion because I had been reading him mm. since I think I was 14 when I read my first Stephen King book. And just, he's such an amazing writer. He's such a generous writer. And he's such a good human being. Mm-hmm. And and so to know that like something I wrote 
impressed him and he enjoyed it just meant the world to me. Wow. And I have not, I, I have not met him. I'm kind of terrified of ever meeting <laughs> him because how do you thank someone who's yeah. affected your career like that in such wow. a major way? Wow. That is incredible. That's a beautiful story. I absolutely love it. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing that. It kind of gives me goosebumps. It's incredible. Um, I have listened to an interview with, with Stephen King and about his process and that he sits down and writes a book and does not know where it's going to end, which just blows my mind. So what is your process? Because these stories to keep people on the edge of your seat and trying hard to outsmart the author and figure things out. I mean, you really have to be so precise. So wh what do you, what do you do when you're plotting your story? Um, first it, it starts with just situation where it's like, okay, I have this situation in mind. And then it's what kind of character is the best person to be in this situation that would bring maximum suspense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, you know, all of their strengths and all their flaws and weaknesses. And then I used to be a huge outliner. Like I would go chapter by chapter. This is how it's all going to be. And I've gotten away from that now where now I like to be a little bit more loose in the writing, but I still always need to know where we're going to end up. Mm -hmm. So with, with survive the night, I always knew the final destination. Okay. I just didn't know how, Charlie was going to get there. And so that was the fun part about writing it and just discovering it as I went along, like, oh, this is going to happen now and it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. And it is, it is so, it is so much fun. I think there's just, um, it's almost an adrenaline rush that you get with a, a book of this style that kind of, um, I mean, it's, it's so escapist and then it just, you're, you're thinking about it. What could it be happening? And, and you're always trying to outsmart it. And I always am reminded of how not smart I <laughs> am apparently because I always miss absolutely everything. So, um, it, it is so much fun. What do you, what do you, enjoy most about this genre maybe as a writer and a reader and what is maybe the biggest challenge because now i think as people become obsessed with your work and they've consumed all of your books they probably think that they know what to be looking for and so you have to stay so many steps ahead yeah it's interesting because the fun part is also the most challenging part and and that is having these twists and these surprises and playing mind games with the reader, like mm -hmm. just sort of knowing, okay, at this point, they're going to be thinking this, and I want them to be thinking this. So we'll lean into this even more. And then later mm -hmm. we're going to swerve and go here. And so it is trying to stay one step ahead of what they might be thinking when they're reading it. But also when you know, as an author, what the twists and surprises are going to be, for me, at least, every clue I write just seems like this big neon sign pointing, like clue, clue, <laughs> clue. And so it's it's a really hard trying to strike a balance of, okay, I want to surprise them, but I have to play fair, but I can't be too obvious what the surprise is. And so it's, it is a tricky balance to strike. And sometimes I think all, you know, lots of authors who do this are, are more successful at times than others about hiding their clues and springing <laughs> nice surprises. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I have not thought about it from the writer's perspective of it's like, hey, look over there. Well, you know, <laughs> wait a second. Um, and, and it's it's the part of the books. Those are the moments that we love because we are we think we're on the path and um, just it, it's incredibly exciting to know that we're we were not on it, but we were all in on the journey um, when you were coming up with this dynamic between Josh and Charlie. I mean, there is um, the idea of two strangers being thrust together and we don't know what their motivations are necessarily, or you don't know everybody's backstory. Um, how was it creating the conversations and the nuances of being in the car with two people? Because I, I really felt very much like I was there and in that space and watching as, you know, it's kind of every little touch and every little movement that happens in this vehicle might have meaning, might be loaded, might be something. Yeah, I, I came at it almost as if it were a, a two-character play. Mm -hmm. I knew dialogue 
was going to be very, very important and that there would be a lot of subtext going on and information needed to be passed through dialogue and just that the characters are thinking one thing, but then saying something else, but you know, sort of, it, it was two people in various states of suspicion about each other. It's like, how much does she know about me? Mm -hmm. How much does he know about me suspecting him? And just this building level of psychological one-upmanship mm -hmm. between them. Mm -hmm. And so I really paid attention to the dialogue because I knew that, let's face it, a lot of the book is just two people in a car talking. <laughs> and so the talking had to be very well done and very important. Mm hmm. Um, and I also hate being in the car on a long drive. Not only do I not like sharing really tight space, but I also hate road trips. So I just keep thinking this is if I was going to feel like I was threatened by a serial killer, this would be the absolute worst way for me to be going down because I would be in just such a panic. I might just open the door on the highway. I mean, it would, it would just be it would just be too much stress for me. So, um, yeah, it was a very exciting journey. I'm curious, obviously you said you mentioned being a, a fan of Stephen King, what you like to consume. I mean, you're now, you know, this, this superstar in, in the, in this space of where people are talking about thrillers and, and horror and imagining that you are obsessed with the dark or with the, the, the scary parts of life. So is that what you like to consume as a reader and as a, a movie watcher or television shows? Or are you looking for an antidote to the fear because you're working in the space? I am absolutely looking for the opposite of, of what I write. I mean, I, I do love a good thriller. I do love a good horror movie. Um, I, I consume both on a regular basis, but there's just something about when you're writing about dark, scary things all the time, you want to escape it. And so, and especially when thing, the outside world is just crazy. So like during this pandemic, it's been, you know, binge watching happy show. It's like Ted Lasso <laughs> and never have I ever on Netflix. And um, just, you know, I've, I've put my Disney plus subscription to very good use <laughs> over the past year. And it is just sort of trying to balance out the heaviness and darkness of my, my writing with brightness. Like when I first turned on my camera, you're like, Oh my God, the wall cover is amazing. And it's like, Yes. Like I wanted something to shoot. This is my office. So this is where I spend all day, every day. And I, I wanted it to be just cheery and happy and as bright as possible. <laughs> well, we, I have found when we're talking to people who write in this space, you, you're expecting people to, to be reflective in their personality of the work that they create, but oftentimes it seems like it's opposite. I mean, um, you know, think about it, uh, Sally Hepworth, who was all bright and sunny and yellows and prints and <laughs> the biggest smile you'll ever encounter. And you're like, but you're writing some dark, spooky stuff, ladies. So it's, I I is it funny to have that dichotomy? Have you noticed that uh, with other authors or, or, or how people are maybe surprised when they meet you? I, I think I, I tend to be pretty open about what things I like. So like, you know, people who follow me on Instagram, like know my love of Taylor Swift. <laughs> they, they know my love of like Disney world. <laughs> and, and so it is. And so I, I don't expect other authors to be dark and dour. And I, most of my, the, the thriller authors that I know and I'm friendly with, we are all just generally happy, nice, normal people. Normal. Maybe not norm. We're normal. <laughs> This is <laughs> writing about serial killers and cars is normal, right? Of course. No, normal is boring. You guys are talented. Um, is there a moment, though, that you remember maybe as a kid where something scared you or you first saw a scary movie or you first encountered a scary book or something and you, I mean, it obviously something imprints to, and to enjoy that rush of fear that can course through the veins and, um, you know, the, fr the first time you saw Freddy Krueger and you they never want to sleep again. What do you remember what what it was or that you got got you interested in this? It was probably um, when I was a, a child in, in the 80s, <laughs> the early 80s, um, there was, you know, that they would have like the Disney 
Wonderful World of Disney mm-hmm. on at like Sunday nights. Mm-hmm. And every Halloween, they showed like clips of like scary things from Disney movies. And one of the things they always showed was um, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Oh. And so there was like the Disney version of the Headless Horseman chasing Ichabod Crane. And just it's so vivid and so scary. And like the, the, the final shot of it is like the Headless Horseman throws his jack-o'-lantern head like it's like mm-hmm. barreling down this covered bridge and flames are coming out of the eyes. And gosh, that just like seared itself onto my psyche when I was a little kid. And it was so scary, but also so interesting and fascinating. And so I loved it. Like I loved being scared by it. Yeah. So I think that was it probably. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, definitely left an impression. No doubt about it. <laughs> and people love to be scared by you. So I can't wait to like, really seriously dig into all your catalog because I am, I'm so, I mean, the, when I picked this up, I'm like, how am I only reading Riley Sager now? This is nuts. So um, survive the night was fantastic. If you had to pick a baby in addition to your, newest youngest baby here survived the night what would you say is the book that most kind of presents the work that you love oh gosh you're asking me to pick favorites i know it is tough they're not listening (laughs) though i have two of them sitting right here they're listening no um i i really can't say because some probably appeal to yeah. You know, Final Girls is very much like people who love slasher movies will love Final Girls. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Home Before Dark is more of a haunted house mm-hmm. story. And so people who like ghostly things might like that one. And so I, I can't, I really can't pick. Well, Sorry. I will, I will tell you that Margaret here read all five over quarantine. Is that correct? I read all four over quarantine and then Survive the Night came out and I read that. And then sat down at Olivia's desk and said, I, I think it's time you read this genre, please. And I'm going to reach out and see. <laughs> it is time you wake up and yes. stop letting the world pass you by. What is wrong? Well, and I have a favorite, which was, has not been mentioned yet. Oh, please do. Last time I lied. Lots of people love that one. That's yes. my absolute favorite. Mm-hmm. But I read Home Before Dark first. And that's what got me into the backlog oh. of, okay, well, now I've read this one. I loved it. Uh, Do you want me to ask my question about it now, yes. Olivia? Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. So you said you did not need any help in researching your 90s for Survive the Night, but you have such a great knack of really putting the reader into these spooky places, um, especially in the car, in the diner, in these different the rest stop, which we've all stopped at a rest stop before. So with Home Before Dark, you get really deep into this haunted house scenario. Did you get to or want to explore haunted houses specifically, get to go tour them or look into them for your research? I I didn't, I wanted, it was, it was inspired by the Amityville horror, but the house, bears no resemblance to the house and the Amityville horror. I wanted it to be its own thing with its own ghost and its own geography. Um, no, it was kind of inspired by and based on a bed and breakfast that I stayed in, in Vermont, where it's like this big house on the top of a hill and it had just all these cool features and was not haunted, I might add. <laughs> But it it just I with with Home Before Dark, I wanted to just build a house and then put in just all types of spooky things that scare me personally, like snakes. I hate snakes. Mm-hmm. Same. And <laughs> and just and things that I thought would be extra creepy, mm-hmm. like the using that song 16 going on 17 from yes. the sound of music, which I I just couldn't think of a better song to make creepy in the t- in, a, in a haunted like it just seemed perfect like okay it's a haunted house and this song just keeps playing in like from the attic on this old record player uh, 16 going on 17 as soon as i thought of it i'm like that's the only song it's the only possible song i can use 
<laughs> it's funny because that's one of the biggest elements of that book that stands out to me is that, you know, you're trying to figure out wh why it's playing, where mm -hmm. it's coming from, because the basis of the book is this girl inherits this home that she says, no, this this was not haunted. This whole book that was written about my family being haunted is not real. And then this stuff starts happening to her. And that's the one piece that I was like, yep, I would I would get out of there at that moment <laughs> when this song starts playing. Not happening. And, yeah, no, I'm out. Bye. <laughs> one but, note but, in. <laughs> yeah, but but Maggie, the, the main character from Before Dark, she does not believe that her house is haunted. Yeah. And so I, I wanted a character who wasn't afraid of that in any way. Like, yeah. I, I think it would have been boring to have someone come into the house and be like, oh, it's haunted. I'm out. I wanted her to come in from a place <laughs> yes. of, of skepticism. You're like, OK, whatever's going on here, it's bull and I'm going to figure it out. It's going to take a lot to to prove that this could be actually something because I don't believe in that kind of stuff. I will tell you, Riley, as you mentioned, um, uh, that every each book is is kind of right for the for somebody. Uh, we were going through the list. And I was reading with my husband. And I was like, oh, okay, which which one am I going to order next? And what am I going to do? And then that one, because he will not do anything haunted. He can't do any any sort of paranormal. And this is like a former SWAT cop. So he's not a, a, a chicken by any means. Uh, <laughs> but anything like that, he's like, supernatural? No, 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 not, not the haunted house one. So don't, he goes, don't even bring the house, the book in the house. <laughs> 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 so I'll have to make my decisions accordingly. <laughs> Riley, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so very much. Um, when will we be expecting the next one from you? The next one will be out in summer of 2022. Oh. And um, it's finished, and that is all I'm I'm allowed to say okay. about it. Ooh, you're a machine. I, I well, it's my only job. Like people, <laughs> people, I get that a lot. Like they're like, "Wow, how do you write so fast?" I'm like, "It's it's it's all I do. Like it's it's my one job." <laughs> Well, thank you so very much. And I got to say, too, and I know you have a graphic design background. We are obsessed with this cover. It is so gorgeous. And so is the website with this. This color scheme is amazing. Oh, thank you. They do. My publisher, oh. Dutton Books, does an amazing job with the covers. They've all just been beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, now we've got I've got a whole weekend planned. I'm going to do some screening. I'm going to watch some Jaws, maybe what, some Misery, listen to my tunes. All thanks to you. It sounds like a great plan. <laughs> His website is Riley Sager Books. So um, uh, great talking to you. Thank you so much. Can't wait till the next time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So Riley Sager survived the night. That's his new one. Mm -hmm. But we've got a backlist that I plan to dig through. And, you know, if Halloween parties are not your jam, um, this is this is a great way to spend uh, the creepy season. Oh, yeah. And like I said, they're they're very in-depth on putting you there. Yes. So it's if you're a little scared of watching horror movies by yourself, these did not give me any trouble. I don't re I don't watch horror movies alone, but these gave me no trouble at all. Final Girls never ha never. Last time I lied. Mm -hmm. Love giving myself a new title. <laughs> um, lock every door. Mm -hmm. Survive the night. Home before and dark. Home before dark. Mm -hmm. All of them are great Ooh. and very different. Well, and that's one thing that you mentioned, which I like, is that obviously people get excited about an author who mm -hmm. is not churning out the same thing all the time, yeah. or you know, the themes even don't feel completely similar. And so it's fresh and you don't know what you're getting. You just know you like the way they tell the stories. Yeah, and and that's why I really enjoyed it because you're not expecting the same place, the same characters, the same context. It's all, he obviously has, you know, the destination of I'm going to trick you. Mm -hmm. This ending is going to happen in the way that he wants it to happen, but the destination, is on his terms, but the journey is all about us. Mm -hmm, totally. And each journey is different. Um, so definitely highly recommend checking out his website because he's got this great movie list too, which is all of the movies that are referenced by Charlie or in, in different moments in the book because she's very into film. And so, you know, we've got a lot of older ones that, um, and of course the, the ha Halloween and Silence of the Lambs and all of that and Jaws and just that kind of general tension yeah. that he's trying to build through the books and, and did so very successfully. Also, though, we mentioned he's got a playlist. Mm -hmm. The Nirvana songs in the car in this book 
are really important to the storytelling and sort of the, the timeline. So it's very much, you know, kind of a care. The music is kind of a character in yeah. this. And we were thinking about when, when else do we see that in books? And it's not too frequently. It's, it's becoming more of a prevalent thing for authors because now we need all of our senses mm -hmm. dealt with, right? I mean, especially as we get more into the technology. So we're seeing more authors make playlists or little mini movie trailers. Mm -hmm. We saw that with TJ Newman's mm -hmm. book, and I believe Riley Sager also has mm -hmm. one for this book. And so we're seeing more of that, right? So using music, especially in thrillers or horror movies, the music really sets the pace of the tone of what's Completely. going on. And it's part of the, the trope. And so differently, um, Ellen Hildebrand, mm -hmm. the queen of the beach read, mm -hmm. as we know, I've only really read a couple of her books, but summer of 69 is set in the summer of 69, believe it or not. <laughs> and every chapter title is a different song oh. from the summer of 69. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's always set in Nantucket. This Chappaquiddick happens in this particular mm -hmm. scenario but all of the music is really putting you there and i believe steppenwolf's on there i know some um jody mitchell so it really gets you right in there and in fact i didn't even look to see if she had a playlist i created my own playlist you based did? on it yes because my parents this they grew up in that time my mother graduated in the year 1969 from high school and so just really felt like that should be part of my experience. And then, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's got a playlist about it. Wow, so, that's cool. Yeah. So I think that's really cool. And I think that really gives the reader a situation where they can be more involved. Um, we've also talked to Zakia Delilah Harris. Harris. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I always have to remember, is it how to say the middle yes. name and then I forget. And she also created a playlist that goes with the other black girl. And she said, the publisher said, hey, you know, you wanna do this or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, when people are doing this for marketing now. And that she had so many songs to put in that, you know, created the theme of this, of, of this story for her in New York and, you know, the songs, they mentioned songs when you're walking into a different, you know, place. And, and um, even I think on the playlist, even nine to five Dolly Parton is on yeah. there because of like the work dynamics. And so it's um, really very clever, a lot of Lauren Hill. And um, but it, it is it's it is it's kind of feeding all the senses. Yeah. And I think as especially as books become more of the the plots for movies, mm -hmm. they're picked up for movies and um, television shows, mm -hmm. I think that's going to become more prevalent because that's kind of the music that they're going to start choosing right. for these for these things. And so it becomes a, we need the visual, we need the audio, we need to be physically there yeah. as well. So figuring all that out. I'm kind of wondering, did we completely miss out on like Daisy Jones and the Six? Did they, did she do a playlist for no, that? No, because they wrote original music. Oh, that's right. So that's going to be a whole other thing. But really, wink, wink, we all know it's Fleetwood Mac. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> oh. That wasn't even, it wasn't even a real wink for me. I was like, so this is Fleetwood Mac. But and that book is so good that I did Google Daisy Jones like nine times. Yeah, well, there is a PDF <laughs> that goes along with the book um, that is all the lyrics. And there are some, Ooh. I believe there are some sung clips to it. Mm -hmm. I can't remember um, specifically, but I thought, okay. Okay, this is very in depth, mm -hmm. but she wrote music for it, and I I just don't know how involved the music got. Oh, okay. So I'm sure we'll hear all about it in some. I could see it as like a, a series. I think kind it of is like, being uh, made into a series for yeah, Netflix. It makes it makes sense yeah. because it reminds me a lot of like Nashville, mm -hmm. which was all their own original music mm -hmm. as well. If you guys ever watched Nashville, yes. R.I.P. Yeah, loved I loved that, I loved show. that show too. And yeah. um, Daisy Jones, I loved so much. And then also we spoke with Allison Larkin, who's um, authored The People We Keep. Mm -hmm. And she also said that she wrote original music for this, yeah. for her character who would be, you know, going and playing out at bars and doing some covers and then also um, some of her original music. So she yeah. was taking guitar and working on that as she found it to be part of her Very process cool. to create this this book. So love it, but I really love 90s music forever and ever. And I'm a crazy Nirvana fan. So um, I especially loved Riley Sager's taste in music. So, Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I'm big 90s music as well. And thinking about it, Come As You Are, 
is the only Nirvana song I feel could envelop those kind of mysterious feelings or you could hear that like starting riff mm -hmm. like while you're sitting in the car mm -hmm. thinking this person might kill me mm -hmm. no other song from their repertoire would work in that same it way it just lends to the angst and the uncertainty of the moment yeah oh i loved it it put me right there oh yeah. yay well thank you very much for this recommendation oh, you're welcome because um otherwise i mean we would still be left out of this boat i mean this was a true recommendation and i will say if you really want to start with any of the Riley Sager books, n not including Survive the Night, I would go with um, Last Time I Lied. Okay. If you like a camp Ooh. and disappearing children, oh, okay. not children, teenagers, uh -huh. it's right up your alley. Oh, okay. It's really I do good. like that. Yeah. And I, do, I, and I do like the Haunted House one. The Haunted House one. I, you know, I think Tony can do it. <laughs> It's paranormal at its best. So okay. you don't have to look at anything. Right. Yeah. So no demonic possession. No. Okay. <laughs> no demonic possession. Thank you again. Maybe, Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. <laughs> She's throwing um, out there a red herring for you to follow yes. the wrong plot line. Um, all right. It is Riley Sager's Survive the Night. Love it. Great book. Highly recommend. Thank you, Margaret, for recommendations. Of course. See you next time. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. We want to hear from you, so send us an email to Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com. Let us know what you're reading and check out the Olivia's Book Club Facebook group. Or you can follow along on Instagram at olivias.bookclub or Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and please tell your friends.